Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Dr. William P. Kelly, who is the Provost and Senior Vice President of the Graduate Center of the City University. Uh, Dr. Kelly is a graduate from Princeton University, summa cum laude, and then he went on to get his MA and his PhD at Indiana University. Uh, then he came to CUNY, and he has been with us for 24 years and has risen to be the provost of the uh, Graduate uh, Center. And uh, you one guest who got here on time because uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the CUNY uh, TV uh, studio is right here at the Graduate an, Center. An easy matter, a quick commute. Right, and it's a, it's a beautiful institution on 34th Street and Absolutely. Fifth Avenue. I don't think any university could get a better location or a more magnificent building because this used to be the old B. Altman building, It right? did indeed. We're delighted to have the space wonderfully redone for us by... Uh, by Gwathney Siegel, the folks who did the extension at uh, Guggenheim and a variety of other right. important yes. projects. And First and class all the way. And you've just been here, I think, uh, about a year. That's, well, we've been here a little longer than that, yeah. but it's been, been about a year that we were settled and, and, and pretty much finished with, uh, with the building. Now tell us, what, what are you, uh, you, you've been the provost for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that you've been working on bringing in new uh, what we call at CUNY distinguished professors. That's correct. So tell us and, and tell us the difference too between a professor and distinguished professor. Right. I mean, although I'm sure all of them think that they're distinguished. <laughs> we like to think that that's so, but at CUNY, distinguished professor is a separate title, really limited to about a maximum of 200 faculty from the entire teaching cadre at the university. And the distinction between professor, where there's a, certainly an expectation of significant scholarly and pedagogic achievement, and distinguished depends really upon extraordinary achievement recognized in an international venue. The vetting process for appointment is, is quite difficult. Um, the institution that nominates a faculty member for that rank gathers letters from scholars really around, not just around the country, but around the world. An independent body then gathers additional information. Uh, the scholarship is reviewed quite scrupulously by independent committees. And finally, after all of that, the appointment uh, is approved by the Board of Trustees. Well, I have confirmation of uh, how great the Graduate Center is because many years ago, before I became a trustee, my son, who went to uh, Berkeley in, in California, the history program, here. Um, wanted right. to study history. Yeah. So he looked at all of the universities, yeah. and he came independently yeah. to the conclusion that the best university for history was the Graduate Center at CUNY. And his professors were uh, Arthur Schlesinger Absolutely. and uh, Richard Wade, who yeah. were really a distinguished professors. No question. I mean, that generation of scholars that really made a difference in the Graduate Center's reputation, visibility, I'd certainly agree with your son's assessment. Um, extraordinary group of faculty. Our task is to replace them. I mean, most of those folks are either retiring or approaching that, that point. And in the initiative that we've been, been pressing for the last couple of years has had to do with replenishment at that rank. I mean, we want to do a couple of things. One, we want to develop um, younger talent at the, at the colleges and the university's initiative to hire more junior faculty is crucial in that regard. But at the same time, we want to hire at the distinguished rank. In history, for example, we've just appointed Richard Wallen, who had a chair at Rice, distinguished intellectual historian. We're delighted to have him. We have another search ongoing in that program. Tell me what, uh, what different uh, um, courses do you have at, at, uh, at the Graduate Center, the PhDs? Right. We have 32 different doctoral granting uh, programs. Which are the five or six uh, biggest ones? Um, largest in terms of enrollment, uh, t psychology, English, art history, history itself, uh, and our music program. In terms of uh, distinction, the pr pretty much across the board, about a third of our programs are ranked in the top 20 by the National Research Council. If you exclude private institutions from that, about a quarter in the top 10 in the country. So it's really a very distinguished a group of programs. We're able to do that because we draw our faculty from across the system. We're not limited to one group of faculty, but we have enormous depth of, of strength because we, we operate in a consortium. And some fashion. of the students study at the uh, different campuses, right? It's, that, that's true, Mr. Rodillo. The In the sciences in particular, we don't have labs here except in speech and hearing. They do their lab work at the colleges and the professional programs, criminal justice, social welfare, business. Uh, those programs are based at the colleges. And almost all of 
our students interact in one way or another with the colleges. We estimate that our students I mean, English alone, for example, teach 25,000 CUNY undergraduates. Our students work as, as adjuncts, as graduate fellows, teaching at the, at the colleges. So there's a great deal of, of exchange and, and, I think, productive conversation between the graduate school and the colleges. How do you do in terms of the time it takes for the students to complete their courses? Because, as you know, right. one of the criticisms that uh, I've had and the mayor has had about the city university is that uh, it takes too long for the students to graduate from the community colleges and from the senior colleges? That's an, that's an extremely important uh, question. As you know, the university is establishing benchmarks and standards for assessing uh, performance. And for the Graduate Center, one of the key benchmarks is time to degree. And this is complicated here because this is a very expensive city in which to live. CUNY is disadvantaged in terms of the amount of financial aid that it has available to offer students in this expensive city. We are the only. Inst but but what is the uh, what is the tuition? The tui well, the tuition is complicated. Tuition is quite low relative to other institutions. Right. Yeah. But the Graduate Center is the only, not one of the, the only research institution in the United States that doesn't offer tuition waivers for doctoral students who provide service to undergraduates. Certainly true at the SUNY colleges, where almost $30 million is available to support tuition remissions for graduate students. We have have no support in that regard. Given those financial difficulties, our students work far more, teach more, have outside employment more than their colleagues at other institutions. Surprisingly, the time to degree statistics are comparable within disciplines across the country. Uh, it's a tribute, I think, to the hard work of our students. One of our goals is to try to increase uh, financial aid for our students and to pursue tuition remissions so that they will be able to finish in a more timely fashion. Now tell me about some of the recent appointees as distinguished professors? We've been trying to target uh, programs where we think an infusion of new lines will make a significant difference, not only in the reputation and visibility of program, but the prospect of recruiting students and being able to place them in, in, in good positions when they graduate. In anthropology, for example, where we had consistent strength, as you were speaking about history in the, in the era of Arthur Schlesinger, we've lost a number of distinguished faculty there. So we've made three new appointments. Neil Smith, one of the the most significant cultural geographers of his uh, of his generation, David Harvey, an absolute star in the world of social sciences, who comes to us from Johns Hopkins. Smith came to us for, from Rutgers. Uh, Harvey was uh, for a time held the chair of geography at at, at Oxford, and Donald Robotham, who comes to us from the from the University of the British West Indies, whose expertise is in the Caribbean diaspora. Those are three major appointments that we think have really have restored anthropology to its national prominence. One of the uh, things that I thought was strange a few years ago is that a uh, professor uh, from the Graduate Center of CUNY in anthropology yeah. came to see me and he told me that he was studying the South Bronx. Yeah. I thought it was strange that uh, anthropologists would consider uh, the South Bronx in, in the in the 80s and 90s right. as a well, an as a side for study. Anthropology is a discipline that is undergoing dramatic rethinking about, about who it is and, and what it ought to be. In fact, this spring we have a seminar in place to discuss the future of anthropology. This is a conversation that's been going on across the country. But CUNY has always emphasized its urban location and its urban concerns. And as far back as the 70s, this was a program that did very significant work in, in whether you want to call it urban anthropology or the anthropology of place. It's one of the reasons we're interested in bringing geographers into the program, because the question of where people live and how they operate is, is a dominant concern. You don't need to go to the South Pacific or to the mm -hmm. North Pole to think about how people interact. I mean, anthropology, you know, in its in its Greek root, means the study of man, and it is, I think, as appropriate to study man in the South Bronx as it is in Rorotonga, uh, and particularly for an urban institution like our own. Well, that's uh, that fine. That was explained to me, but I thought it was strange because we've been used to. Uh, of course, I mean, our notion of anthropology is Margaret societies. Mead and Ruth Benedict yeah. in Samoa, uh, or Malinowski in the in, in the South Pacific, but. Really, I think one of the concerns of this institution is to be cognizant of where we are and in the population we serve. I mean, it's a public institution, and in a variety of our disciplines, an urban emphasis is, I think, both appropriate and, and establishes part of the leadership that the Graduate Center has been able to exercise in, in the academic community. 
Okay, now who, have, who has been appointed recently? What professors have been appointed? Well, as I said, in anthropology, Harvey Smith and yeah. Robotham are, are major appointments. We've also looked in political science to establish a stronger connection to the United Nations. I mean, we are here on 34th Street, and we've brought Francis Deng, uh, one well, of... Well, if you can figure out the United Nations, you're <laughs> making a great service. I leave this to the people we're appointing, Mr. Mazzia. Uh, or even the Congress, if you can well, study that. As we a haven't even former begun... Former member of well, Congress, I, I can I, tell I you. leave that to your good judgment, but we haven't, uh, haven't begun to approach that issue. But at the United Nations, I mean, our sense, again, is that what are the strengths of CUNY? What kinds of opportunities exist? And the connection with the United Nations seemed very obvious to us. And we've appointed Francis Deng from the Brookings Institute, who mm -hmm. is the permanent representative on dis internally displaced people at the United Nations, a man with an extraordinary career in human rights concerns uh, from the Sudan. Tom Weiss, who comes to us from the Watson Center at Brown University, uh, who again, an expert on NGOs and UN connections. He's involved in, in, in writing a, uh, an extremely s important series of texts and organizing a project on the intellectual history of the United Nations. The founders of the United Nations are beginning to, to, to depart the earth, and Tom's in doing a lot of videotaping and interviewing and putting together a series of, of texts that talk about the intellectual grounding and foundation. Susan Woodward also joins us from um, from the Brookings Institute, uh, one of the world's leading authorities on the Balkans. So we're trying to build areas of strength where we can, in fact, address our, our urban circumstances, our connection to the United Nations. And this is, as you well know, one of the most polyglot international cities on Earth. And I think it's appropriate for us to engage in that area. So we've targeted uh, concern there. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the uh, biggest urban problem that we have in New York City and in cities of this country is education. Yes. And that's why I pushed to get something that we didn't have before right. at the uh, Graduate Center. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is a graduate degree, a PhD in education. Because as you know, we have uh, apparently a very huge shortage of teachers. Yes, we do. And we also have, uh, we're moving uh, with the new administration in Washington towards uh, a different outlook in education. Mm -hmm. So I want to discuss that with you after we... Uh, hear these announcements. Terrific. You don't have to like me. Or you can. <laughs> you don't have to run with me. You really don't have to run away from me. And we're not all that different. I like good food. Good music. I want a good job. I want my kids to live in a world where they are safe and loved and respected for who they are. You don't have to like me. But if you talk to me. You might. We can end prejudice if we talk to each other. Call. Tell us what you do. Together we can build one America. We're back today with Dr. William P. Kelly, who is the provost and senior vice president of the Graduate Center at the City University. And we were talking about a PhD in urban education, mm -hmm. which I wanted to have because many years ago I taught at Fordham University mm -hmm. in the Graduate School of Urban right. Education. Right. And I couldn't understand all the years that I've been as trustee of uh, CUNY, why we didn't have a PhD yeah. in education, because the largest uh, percentage of teachers in the school system come from the city university. So finally, the uh, program was approved by yeah. the Board of Trustees, yeah. and we're now gearing up for it. Tell and, us about it. And we're it. very excited about it. Like you, it was always uh, a subject of concern for me, curiosity as well why the City University didn't have a, a doctoral program in education. Not only, as you say, because it is an institution that produces the lion's share of teachers within the system, but also because of the research possibilities in education, urban education yeah, in particular, we have the, it we exists. Have what a, lab, right what a laboratory. I mean, yeah. the most extraordinary set of circumstances in the city. And there had been, a, in, until recently, I, th I think, uh, a lack of, of Congress between the two systems, the mm -hmm. fact that the Chancellor uh, Levy and, and Chancellor Goldstein are in fact uh, reversing that as very positive for us. But one of my concerns in taking the job was to fast track that project and we're very grateful for the board's support in, in having that happen. The program that will begin in September, we're currently taking begin applications. This September. And, and I want to be sure that uh, uh, we don't forget to say it. 
you, the time to file applications for those who are watching the program is February 15th. That's correct. Right. So that doesn't give us much time. It so. does. It doesn't. We're up, but we want to get up and running quickly, perhaps with a, a small contract. There's still and If people are interested, right? there's interested. the application process is ongoing, and okay. if, if people are interested in applying, they should certainly write to the PhD program in urban education here at the at the CUNY Graduate Center. It's a two-pronged program, as, as you know. Part of it has to do with examining questions of curriculum, what's taught, how it's taught mm -hmm. within urban circumstances, to interrogate the question of the urban. To what extent is, is the urban a different circumstance that requires different kinds of teaching, technique, talent, well, and so forth? According to what uh, uh, Commissioner Mills, right. the Commissioner of Education, right. has told me uh, here in right. this program and, and publicly, uh, he is going to require uh, very shortly that all teachers have a specialty in the courses in which they teach. In the past, right. you could be a teacher if you just had a of bachelor's course. degree yeah. in anything, and then you could teach yeah. uh, whatever I mean, you wanted. Precisely. Part of the, the premise of this program is that that's uh, the program we're beginning, is that that's an important issue, and I think people salute Rick Mills's decision to do that. But the other question is, do you need particular skills and talents to, to do this in an urban circumstance. Yes. And there's a shocking lack of research, Mr. Badillo, on this, on this question. Well, and that's I can what tell we're you trying to do. From the years that I taught at the Graduate School of Education at Fordham, that most of my students said that nobody gave them any practical courses right. on what was going on right. in the school system. Yeah. I mean, both from the point of view of curriculum and from the point of view of policy, there is a dearth of, of solid research in the area. We brought people, the, the, the chair of the education school, the uh, dean of education, rather, at Berkeley and at Penn, both of whom are wrestling with the same kinds of questions. How do you begin to think about urban education? And the answer continues to be more research. And here we are sitting with this extraordinarily, extraordinary laboratory for research, the New York City public school system. We're very excited uh, at the close connections we've been able to forge with the school system. Uh, and look forward to this being a real contributor, the program a contributor to the discourse about urban education in this country. Well, you talked about standards, and it happens that my wife is a, a public school teacher. Mm -hmm. She teaches the seventh grade. And uh, one of the problems uh, I find and she finds is that the standards for what should be required at each grade are not very clear. Right. Uh, do the standards exist? and? or can they be formulated? Precisely. I mean, as, I, as I, I started to say, there are two tracks. One is to look at curriculum. The other is to look at policy matters. And that is, is an issue that falls squarely in the, in the ladder, under the ladder rubric. What ought to be policy? What kinds of standards should be set? What's productive? What's effective? Clarity, clarity, clarity. And I think we, we largely lack that at, at the moment. So this is an attempt to contribute to that conversation. But the other problem that we have, and that we and I certainly yeah. have faced at the City University is that we are living in a period when a large number of uh, leaders in the um, urban centers do not believe in tests. For example, last year the um, NAACP passed a resolution, which I thought was incredible, uh, saying that uh, they want all tests to be abolished. Mm. So, and there are uh, many leaders who are against the idea of having tests. That's mm. one of the problems I face. Yeah when I tried to uh, uh, impose and was successful in yeah. imposing tests at the city university. I think so how are we going to set up standards against the opposition, the very strong yeah. opposition, of groups who are against tests? I, I think that the response, at least from a research institution, to matters of public debate like the one you refer to is data. I mean, what's the data? What what's the evidence that, that overcomes passion and subject position debates. I believe this, I believe that. What's the ground for the belief? What's the evidence? Well, the ground for the belief uh, is that uh, uh, over a period of time, uh, black leaders say that tests discriminate against blacks. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know how you can prove or disprove that. What, well, what we'd like to be able to do, or at least to contribute, is data that addresses that kind of question. Uh, I think the debate has become one that generates more heat than light and the ways, I think, to make the debate more refined and to move everybody in the direction that we want to go is, is through research. I mean, that's why institutions like the Graduate Center address, to try in the most dispassionate way possible to test assertions and assumptions and to come up with policy that's grounded in, in data. And I think 
that that's one of the questions that would most benefit from more aggressive examination and less impassioned questions about how this plays out in my community. The other issue, which I believe we are finally coming to an agreement on, is the question of uh, eliminating social promotion. Yeah. And I must say that I have never found any research which justifies social mm -hmm. promotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, if uh, they told me that uh, it was based on uh, sociological theory, but I've never heard of any sociologist who yeah. wrote such a theory. Well, so one of the problems we have in education is that uh, instead of research, things and standards are set up which uh, have no yeah. intellectual basis. Well, for. I mean, theory is a problematic term. I mean, I think it's important to theorize research and to think about umbrellas that govern judgment. But theory that has is not grounded in data, not grounded in facts that can be put on the table and debated and discussed, frankly, I think is not terribly productive. And yeah, but nevertheless, in, in, even yeah, though it was not grounded, yeah. well, social promotion has a very strong hold precise, in the minds of many and people. And this is particularly so in education and in urban education as a subset even more so, that there's a lot of debate and a lot of shouting and, and a relatively small amount of, of, of solid data that grounds those judgments. And again, this is a program that, that proceeds from no ideological assumption other than the importance of research and a recognition that New York City schools, the New York City school system grounds and enables that kind of work to go forward. Well, well we, those of us who certainly have been in elective office, yeah. um, would certainly welcome more data because for example, one of the arguments that's going right. on today, I mean, the mayor just testified yeah. a couple of days yeah. ago in uh, Albany, I heard and that. you remember the uh, decision of a uh, Supreme Court judge uh, last week right. about the importance of uh, having more money in right. the school system. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there are many other people, yeah. the mayor included, who say that uh, money is not the answer, that yeah. the answer is having standards. I think it's do both and. Any, do we have any? Uh, real data that could help us move along yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, walk around those. Uh, yeah, those. I mean, there are, there are some da data available about number of students in classroom, right. for example. That's pretty solidly established. But a lot of other things are, are, are really opinions that aren't grounded. And what I would hope would happen, and I think certainly this is the direction of educational research, not just here, but in the country, is to attempt to yoke questions of academic research and policy judgment more closely than they have been in the past. Certainly that's what we hope to do here. The other issue which is coming up now with the uh, uh, Bush administration right. is the, uh, the question of choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have public schools, you have uh, charter schools, you have uh, vouchers. Right. And uh, apparently there's a great deal of support for vouchers in communities because right. uh, when a group of uh, people uh, offered scholarships, 2,500 scholarships, mm -hmm. to uh, parents in the in New York Far City. More 168,000 right. families applied, yeah. and that shows that apparently there's a great desire on the part of the parents to move away from the public school system. Right. But the political leaders are against that. Yeah. Is this one of the issues that will be studied as well? Of course. Uh, I mean, well? there is no more dominant issue in the in the realm of public education than vouchers and choice. And, you know, people study the Milwaukee circumstance. I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but like everyone involved in education has certainly tried to, to keep abreast of the conversation. And here again, I think one needs to look at the consequences of charter schools, which ones work, which ones don't, what's the experience of choice, how, how is it played out. And, and again, not so much research that begins with, I think people should have choice or no, I think we should maintain the hegemony of the public schools, but research that tries to ground public policy decisions in some kind of empirical base. So certainly that's, you know, that is a, there is not an education school in the country that's not grappling with that question. And our point of view is to make certain that the, the conversation, or to try to make certain that the conversation, at least in New York, takes place with the benefit of some research and grounding that enables public policy folks to make decisions that, you know, to one extent, respond to the interests of their constituents, but in an informed fashion uh, with a sense of evidence so that we don't inflict on a generation of children a set of ungrounded experiments. I mean, what we really want is to do the very best for our kids, and I think everybody agrees on that point. Well, I can tell you from my experience yeah. that you better make sure that the uh, research is uh, absolutely well documented because from what I've seen, 
there's absolutely nothing you can do right. that does not uh, lead to uh, demonstrations and attacks from people Look, who say that you have a secret agenda. I mean, in I've in been an area that is as heated as this and attracts so much debate on either side, your research has got to be absolutely solid and the premises that drive it have to be as free from political basis as it's possible to be. And you know, nothing is, is it doesn't have some kind of ideological cast. Uh, and, but it's important, I think, particularly in these kinds of issues, as you say, that that research has to be solid. Well, I hope, uh, I hope that you succeed. Well, so do it, I. It's a difficult task, but certainly the most important task. And it's one task, that the City University is called concerned. to. I quite agree. Okay, well, good luck. and Thank you very much. Today. Enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.